on this crispy morning. It's nice and refreshing, don't you think? Don't you love snow? <laughs> it's too bad it's only a quarter inch and it has uh, paralyzed the city. <laughs> a couple of things. Um, remember uh, um, your baskets for cross lines that if you were doing the reverse advent calendar you can bring those in any time between now and the first of the year we'd like them by the first of the year but even if they come in after we will make sure they get to cross lines um, and the big announcement I have is next Saturday night is Christmas Eve and of course on Christmas Eve we have three worship services 538 and 11. You, know, uh, you can read your uh, messenger and find out more about those worship services. And then next Sunday, a week from today, which is Christmas, we will have one worship service at 10 a.m. That's all I have to say. Oh, excuse me, our gospel lesson is the story Matthew gives of the birth of Jesus and he tells that story through Joseph, Jesus' father. And um, we're going to see how, uh, we're going to hear Joseph's dream today, and we're going to see how God works in the lives of Joseph and his um, ancestors, and we'll see how God works in our lives. I'm done. Let us pray. All loving God, we continue to wait. Our anticipation is great for the greatest of gifts, the gift of love, the love of the Son that you gave to us, the love 
that moves between the Father and the Son and will now move between the Son and us. Be with us in this final week as we await his coming, that we may know the joy of his incarnation. These things we ask in the name of that Son who will be named Jesus. Amen. Please rise and join in singing. Together in this place of worship, you pray. Beginning of creation. Love, Love is, is the, the gift, gift of, God. of God. Love is a light given by God in the teaching of the prophets. Love, Love is, is the gift, gift of God, God revealed, revealed in the life of Christ. Christ. Love is a light given by God, the Son of God, the Son of Mary.
Let us pray. Source of light, shine in our lives and in our world. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, who created us and all we see and hope to see. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, whose coming we await with longing. Because he redeems us and shows us love, grace, and forgiveness. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the sacred breath that enters our lives, giving us strength in this life and in the next life everlasting. our sin in the presence of God and one another. Merciful and forgiving God, we confess that we continually miss the mark in our thinking, in our speaking, and in our actions. We leave things incomplete. We neglect our neighbors. We wait patiently for the coming of Jesus, who comes to us as a gift. Help us to receive him. 
Help us share our gifts with all creation. To the glory of your name. good news and one of the ways we re glorify God is by receiving his gift to us his forgiveness to us so it is my pleasure to say that Almighty God for the sake of Jesus Christ forgives you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the first chapter. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had bore a son. And he named him Jesus, the gospel of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you. Good to see you 
on probably the coldest morning we've had for at least two years, right? It is great. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My sermon, Love, God is with us. We're going to talk about dreams because Joseph had a dream. How about you? Do, do, do we all remember our dreams? I mean, yes, sometimes. Many of them, or some of them. And, um, but there are some people who tell me they don't remember their dreams. I find that interesting. Have you ever been, felt moved by a dream? Because it moved to do something because of a dream. Have you? Have you ever felt that God was speaking to you in a dream? <laughs> Even husbands and wives disagree on that one. A week ago, when we were doing home communions, one of our elderly members says, Pastor Dan, I've been having, I've been dreaming about my nephew. And I go, oh, wow. Well, tell me about your nephew. I haven't seen him for 30, maybe 40 years. This woman is in her early 90s. I go, well, that's a long time. And she said, but why am I dreaming about him? And now it's gotten to the point I'm thinking about him. And I said, I don't know, what do you think? There's got to be something there. God must be doing something there. Why else would I dream that way? And I said, well, why don't you call up your nephew? <laughs> I don't know where he lives. I said, where was the last time you saw him? He lived in Milwaukee. I said, do you know a private investigator? No, she didn't. So I said, give me his name. I know some, someone. I have no news to report yet. <laughs> she obviously felt, I dreamt something. I need to do something. In this case, I need to do something. Sometimes our dreams are just dreams, right? Dreams, sometimes you sense the presence of a loved one, and sometimes you think, oh, well, I should go give that person a call or whatever. Sometimes, it's obvious that our worries and anxieties from our daily life are being acted out and being expressed in the dream, and it's sort of a um, stress reliever. And dreams do that. In fact, the more you dream, the more you can be in that deep sleep where you dream, the more psychologically uh, well you feel. Because feel. You, you release... Uh, tensions. You used to have a dream, and I'm sure many people who have been students have the dream, that you showed up for a final, and then you remembered you, you never went to that class. You, you missed every, that's what was my, I, why didn't I go to class? <laughs> I, I asked myself. That was my dream. So I'm, I'm working out some anxiety from daily life. Now it's get up in the pulpit and I don't have anything to say. Did I miss work this week? What happened, you know? All right. So we work out our worries and anxieties. And occasionally, dreams are where God speaks to us and we feel we must act. But jo Joseph had a dream like that. 
he finds out, or he, he's engaged, the, the Bible calls it betrothed. It's not quite the same as our engagements because uh, generally an engagement ring is given. How easy it is to, is it to break an engagement? Very easy. Don't want to be, I don't want to marry you anymore. And sometimes the bride-to-be throws the ring at the groom in anger. Sometimes she says, you gave it to me, it's mine. But you break it, they break off pretty easy, don't they? Can. But with Joseph and Mary, when they're betrothed to one another, there's a contract already. The only way that engagement can be broken is through divorce. And Joseph could do it publicly, goes and gets the priest, and they either go down to the town square or in the temple itself, and Joseph yells, I divorce you three times, and he's divorced. And in this case, when he would do it publicly, and Mary was found to be pregnant, she would be shamed, and her entire family would be shamed. And depending on how fully they followed the Old Testament law, they may even stone Mary for her betrayal of Joseph, her unfaithfulness, her obvious adultery. Something has to happen. God speaks to Joseph in a dream. An angel comes to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, reminds him of his great lineage. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For what is happening in her is a holy thing. A holy thing. Joseph is suffering. Mary is suffering. I, I mean, we, we know that Joseph had to be struggling over this whole thing to make that decision to divorce her quietly. Mary must have been struggling over it. Uh, David Luce reminds us that anybody in church this morning could be struggling. Put it this way. We have, each of us, experienced similar upheavals. Have we? I've had parents come to me with their teenage kids and the father doesn't carry a shotgun, but you know what's going to happen. Who knows, writes David Luce, how many of the folks in front of you are struggling to hold it all together while at church. Families who struggle with discord, couples who feel disconnected, kids wondering what future they may have, elders wondering the same from a different point of view. Some seek jobs, some relationships, some any sense of acceptance or worth. It's into the ordinary lives of Mary and Joseph and their struggles that God chooses to act. And it's good news for us because that same God of love chooses to act in us. How do I know that? Well, God, Matthew tells us, works through scandalous people. You see, it's believed that Matthew is writing to Jewish people. He's tracing Joseph's lineage through males, in particular, because that's where the inheritance comes down through, the males. And uh, we see in his genealogy, which are the verses right prior to this, the genealogy of Jesus, where he lists 42 males and four women. Four women. The unusual thing about the women, we're going to get to that, is they would, aren't who you expect. And what they believe is that Joseph is dealing with Jewish people who are looking at Mary and they're going, with that scandal, how can God possibly be working through that woman? 
And Matthew is saying, excuse me, because that's exactly the way God does things. He works through scandalous people, scandalous sinful people, so that he can enter our lives in love and be God with us. Let's look at the genealogy of, uh, of Matthew. The genealogy of Jesus as Matthew gives it. 42 males. And, you know, they're fine people. Comes to Abraham, is the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, the first woman, Tamar. Well, why would he mention Tamar? Of all the ancestors you'd think he would have hidden, it would be Tamar. Tamar, if you remember, was Judah's daughter-in-law. The Bible says that Tamar's husband displeased the Lord and he died. So according to Lever Leverite rule, marriage rule, her husband's brother comes and is supposed to have offspring. And he refused to do that, he dies. The next brother, Shelah, Judah says to Tamar, uh, who by the way, Tamar may have been a Gentile. Judah says, you stay a widow until Sheila grows up. Right now he's afraid to marry you because he doesn't want to die. But he gets old enough, he doesn't show up. So she dresses up like a prostitute when Judah comes by. And Judah goes and does what people do with prostitutes. And that's where Perez and Zerah, two sons were born, twins. Matthew, 42 men, must have been 42 different women, he pay, picks Tamar to tell us about. Well, then he continues. I'll skip a few verses. And Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Oh, come on, Matthew, cut it out. Every, do we know who Rahab was? She was a prostitute who was um, the one who hid the spies that came from the people of Israel when they spied on the land of Canaan. Rahab. Really? Matthew has to emphasize her? And then he goes on. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And there's a little bit of scandal there, but I don't have time to get into it all. And Ruth, by the way, a Gentile. And then we go down a couple more verses. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He doesn't say by Bathsheba, by the wife of Uriah to really announce that scandal to us. Uriah being a Gentile again and David having an affair with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and killing Uriah. Scandal, 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 scandal. Shame on Matthew. But he, he's trying to tell us that's exactly who God works through. Scandal 
the ugliness of their lives. But God works through it and does something good. He brings to birth into this world his love called Emmanuel. God is with us. Don't you find that fascinating? This is the first year I found the genealogy of Jesus fascinating. <laughs> Those four women, Gentiles, outsiders, scandalous behavior. So the good news then is that God chooses to work through ordinary people like you and I. Not saying that you necessarily have scandal in your lives, but Yes, maybe. Scandalous behavior. God works despite even in and through the scandal. God can come to us at times we least expect, in ways we least expect, and through those whom we least expect. It is through us, ordinary people, that the one who is Emmanuel is God with us, and he works in and through us. John Ortberg says this, the central, Bible in the, the central promise in the Bible is not, I will forgive you, although, of course, that promise is there. It is not the promise of life after death, although we are offered that as well. The most frequent promise in the Bible is, I will be with you. Sinful, scandalous people, you will be with us through our good, redeem our good. Excuse me, through our bad, redeem our bad, and work through us. So how is our God of love expressing God's self through you and yours? Think about that. How is God doing that? We've got that promise, I believe, through these words the people he works through. He's working through you. Charles Randall tells the story of Jim. Uh, Randall serves a city, a, 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 church, a, a church that was in a city, an inner city. But it was a big church, prestigious church. And there was a man in town by the name of Jim who had come and just stopped by, often stopped by because he wanted something. But he stopped by one Saturday when Pastor Randall was working on his sermon. And he sits down in Pastor Randall's office and Pastor Randall says, yes, Jim, what do you want? He's uh, a little annoyed that Jim showed up on that day. Jim has thick glasses, can hardly see. He doesn't bathe regularly, so he's a mess. Mismatched clothing, that's dirty. And Jim, Jim says, oh, I don't want anything. I just came by. Just came by. Pastor Randall tries to get rid of him. Well, Jim, I'm kind of busy. And Jim says, I'm moving tomorrow. And Pastor Randall goes, oh? Yeah, remember that woman I've been paying a little rent to? I've been with her for three years. She had cancer. She's a wonderful woman, but she had cancer and she finally died. I've been taking care of her those three years, and I believed she loved me. I surely loved her. I surely loved her, but we never talked about it. And he said, you know, Pastor, I'm just kind of feeling sentimental. The pastor took that as, 
I'm grieving. So he said, and of course by this time, the pastor is feeling about two inches tall. And he said, Pastor, I didn't stop by to give you anything, or to, to take, get anything. I want to give you something. And he handed him a bag. And when the pastor opened up the bag, it was full of eyeglasses. And Jim goes, those are my old eyeglasses. I thought of you, and I thought you could give them to one of those less fortunate people. He said this. Of course, Pastor Randall says, less fortunate, and again, he's feeling smaller. You know, people are out there who have very little, and look, I have so much. Must be at least five or six pairs of glasses in the sack. God has given me more than I deserve. I just want to help out. I'll send you a postcard from Indiana. I think I still have a sister up there. So with that, he stood up, shook Pastor Randall's hand, and left. And Pastor Randall never saw him again. But Pastor Randall realized someone who he dismissed, Jim, that Almighty God was really at work in him. So the question still comes, how is our God of love, who's always with us, working in and through you? Amen. Rise and join in singing as we share our ties and offerings.
God of love, we lift up the church universal and all the servants of the gospel. We remember poets and artists, musicians and preachers, and theologians and teachers. We pray that all would proclaim that God is with us in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. God of Israel and all the world, we pray for the nations and those in authority. We pray for your peace and justice throughout the world and for those who advocate on behalf of others. May all in positions of leadership choose what is good for life. Lord, in your mercy. God, our healer, let your gentle spirit descend upon those for whom we offer our prayers. We remember especially Jeannie Burnell Graves, Carolyn Callum, Jeff Dykeman, Lou Graves, Doug Holbein, Robin Kennedy, Alan Malcolm, Jack Myers, Chris Marquardt, Wayne Myers, Bill Payne, Chris Plate, Jim Raisins, Pat Roper, Pat Chicaney, Bonnie Turner, Rod West, and Marietta Young. Are there any others? Receive our thanksgiving for the saints, those who have died and now are at rest. We remember especially Alan Caymans, Ray Umland, and Mary Lou Fisher. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, we commend into your care and leading those who travel near and far, those who prepare our congregation for worship and celebration, and for those who gather around word and sacrament, that all would experience welcome and refreshment. Lord, in your mercy. your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, the beginning and the end, our salvation and our hope. We praise you for creating a world of order and beauty. When we brought on chaos, cruelty, and despair, you sent the prophets to proclaim your justice and mercy. At this end of the ages, your son Jesus came to bring us your love and to heal all the suffering world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore as life, death, and resurrection, we await his coming again in righteousness and peace. Send your spirit on us, and on this bread and wine we share. Strengthen our faith, increase our hope, and bring to birth the justice and joy of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, our, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we believe. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The table is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. You are a God that promises to be with us always. And as we leave here today, as we leave here filled with your love, help us to share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Glory to God.